I'm going to invite you to remain seated for the reading of God's Word this morning. Please turn to Acts chapter 18, and we're going to look at verse 24 to chapter 19, verse 10. Acts 18, 24 to 19, 10. And the title of this sermon is Christianity is New. Last week, the title of the sermon was Christianity is Jewish. And so we talked about how, well, you can listen to it online. <laughs> but this week, and not contradicting in any way, Christianity is also new. And we're going to look at the newness of Christianity, the new covenant, particularly through the baptism of John and how that's highlighted in the story that we're looking at this morning in the book of Acts. As we've talked about, Acts is the unfolding of the it is finished that Jesus cried out at the cross. It is the unfolding, the advancement of the kingdom of God through the ascension of Jesus and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit out onto the church. We see King Jesus, the ascended and throned Savior of the universe, saving the world through His weak people empowered by the Holy Spirit. Through our suffering, through our celebration, and through our words of witness. That's what we see. And so we see that story continue to unfold in Acts 18.24 to 19.10. Listen now to God's holy, beautiful word. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people, that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy and, and they the, the sorry, when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God, God for His word, word to us. us. Amen. As I was preparing for this sermon, you know, pastors aren't supposed to like show all the math of all their sermon preparation. But I want to tell you something really cool that happened to me. Things became more simple for me, which 
For a pastor, that's, that's kind of miraculous, right? <laughs> Things became more simple for me as I was studying this. And as I was thinking about this baptism of John and how, you know, it'd be easy just to preach one, the first story and then wait till next week to preach the other story. But obviously the whole John's baptism thing kind of ties these things together. It doesn't come up a whole lot, right, in the book of Acts. But here you got this being emphasized. What's going on here? But what I was reminded of is that Christianity is the fulfillment of the old covenant promise. And this is going to sound like what's called a tautology. Like you say the same, like a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. But, you know, hear me out. Christianity is the fulfillment of the old covenant promise. And the old covenant promise was the promise of the new covenant. And so what's the content of the new covenant? It's the indwelling of the spirit of adoption in union with Jesus Christ. Amen. Through his, it is finished. It's as we read this morning, the time and place time and space appearance of God in the flesh to be our sacrifice, to actually in time and space secure and accomplish the forgiveness of our sins, having lived in our place, the good life that we can't live. You know, people talked about Justin Bieber uh, wanting to live like Jesus. I posted an article on Facebook. You can look at it. You know, there's cussing, whatever. But if you never hear cuss words, you're probably not engaging the world very well. Um, but he's, he presents his, his a testimony of faith in Jesus. And he talks about wanting to, to be like Jesus. And people are mocking him online, you know. But, and that made me think about this. That the good news is not Jesus came here and said, be like Jesus. The good news is that Jesus came to be like Jesus in your place. <laughs> that God would come and be like Jesus in your place. Because you ain't like Jesus. And then take your criminal record, your not like Jesusness on himself at the cross and, and suffer the wrath of God that your sin deserves and die and rise again from the dead for real. Having cried out, it is finished. And he wasn't lying. God came to do it all for you. And you will either stand on your doing in the final judgment, ultimately, or you will stand on his doing. There is no other option. Amen. And so if you are not resting on the doing of Jesus, may God enable you to repent and be filled with the Holy Spirit this morning as you believe on the Lord Jesus, whose name means the Lord is salvation. Amen. The Lord saves. Not I save, but the Lord saves saves and Jesus is the Lord you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins this is good news the good news is not be a good person the good news is Jesus is a good person in your place that'll preach this is fun you know I was tired this morning I was joking that if I wasn't your pastor, I probably would have slept in. <laughs> Just being honest, <laughs> right? So it's a miracle that y'all are here, and I don't really fault those who didn't, you know, right? But I'm alive, man. I'm filled with the Spirit because this is good news. Amen. Jesus is worth getting up for, Amen. you know? And, and it's not worth getting up for to hear, you know, be a good person, love people, help people. If that's not if that's not following a therefore with Jesus in front of it and what He did for you, it's powerless and it's just enslaving. It's moralism. So the old covenant was the promise that God would show up and do it, uh, and that God you know would actually dwell in us. Yes, people under the Old Covenant had the Holy Spirit with them. He had to make them born again so that they could know the Lord and believe on the Lord. Jesus gently nudges Nicodemus about this. You're a teacher in Israel and you don't know this stuff? That you have to be born again? So of course people had the Spirit in the Old Testament who were believers. But they didn't have Him dwelling in them like we see happening in Acts 19 here. The Spirit coming to dwell in them in that New Covenant way. And so the setting of this story is a very curious place in history. This overlap between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. You've got disciples who are kind of connected with believers, but they didn't even know about the whole, like, what? So this, is, this can be confusing, but don't be confused by this. 
This was a very unique time in history. You've got Simeon, when Jesus was born, who was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And he got to see Jesus before uh, Simeon died. He got to see Jesus. He got to behold the Lord. There were other people who were looking for the consolation of Israel who didn't get to hear about Jesus, right? Dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. So this is a kind of an interesting, unique, non-repeatable time of overlap between the Old and New Covenant. So, Christianity is the fulfillment of the Old Covenant promise, which is that God would show up, take care of all of it for you so that God could live inside of you to make you not only individually but corporately, corporately the living temple of God as the down payment for Him coming to make the whole earth the temple of God. You know, us, but in it, the new Jerusalem, the consummation of all things. The Spirit is the guarantee. And He comes to live in us and give life to these mortal bodies. So let's look first at the Old Covenant from this story. Look, um, look back at... Uh, Acts 18, 24. And let's listen to, let's listen about Apollos' theology. Okay? Apollos' theology. And what's so cool, especially for Presbyterians, if you don't know what I'm going to say, don't worry about it. But it's really cool for Presbyterians to hear Apollos' doctrine be described as accurate, but then having him be instructed about being more accurate. You know, we should be humble. We're lifelong learners. And that means that God graciously describes as accurate Someone who's lacking certain things, and then he wants to make us more accurate. So there's, there's, it's a growth process. We shouldn't be proud. We shouldn't think that we don't need to be instructed more accurately. And we should be patient with those who need to be instructed more accurately. Does that make sense? Amen. So Apollos, look at his theology. He's like, yeah, okay, but you know, you need some more stuff. So, and there's a little Bible study around the dinner table at Ananias. I mean, at, uh, not Ananias. He was dead by that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Priscilla and Aquila's house. So the old covenant. Look, now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now, this is curious. So let's kind of click on the baptism of John. And who is John the Baptist? You know, if you're like me, when you read John's gospel, remember John the Apostle is different from John the Baptist. When you read John's gospel, you start reading this real kind of philosophical, kind of abstract, but kind of just beautiful. Like in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and in Him, He was with God in the beginning, and with and all things are made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. You're like, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, and there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And it's like this weird theological speed bump. You're like, wait a second. Why would John write about John the Baptist? It's like, he, you're ruining the shot in the movie. Like, let's just see Jesus. Why are you bringing John into this? John is a bigger deal than we know. And I want us to see that this morning. Look at Matthew 11, 9 to 14. Matthew 11, 9 to 14. This is what Jesus said about John the Baptist and his ministry. Matthew 11, 9 to 14. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Matthew 11, 9 to 14 says this. This was after uh, when John the Baptist was in prison, he sent some of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you really the Christ? Now remember, John had proclaimed Jesus as the Christ, but it's interesting what suffering will do to you, right? It messes with your head, right? It brings doubt sometimes. And so John's like, are you for real? Like, are you really the Christ? Because this isn't how I thought the Christ was supposed to you know, do stuff. <laughs> so here's what Jesus says to the disciples, like vindicating John the Baptist, not rejecting him, not saying, oh, you doubting one. He's, he's, he's backing up John the Baptist. And here's what he says about him. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, he's quoting the Old Testament here. So John the Baptist was prophesied specifically in, uh, in the Old Testament. In Malachi. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. So what does that imply? Who's the you there? Jesus. 
I will prepare your way before your face, talking to John the Baptist prophetically. But, oh, sorry, no. I will send my messenger before your face. So he's talking to Jesus. And then the messenger is John the Baptist. So obviously this is a prophecy he says later on in Malachi. I, the Lord himself will come to you. I will come to the temple. I will purify Israel. God's saying, I'm going to show up in the flesh for judgment and salvation. But this prophecy of John the Baptist, so verse 11, Assuredly I say to you, this is what Jesus says about John the Baptist. Imagine this being said of you, but it's actually better for you. Listen. Assuredly I say to you, among those born of women, who does that not cover? Okay, I'm just saying. Just keep in mind, you wake up, right? Among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. Think about King David, the man after God's own heart. Think about King Solomon and all his wisdom and wealth and wives. Sorry. And then think about you know, all these other people in the Old Testament. You know, there's, there's none greater than John the Baptist. But here's this incredibly shocking New Testament, New Covenant in your face thing that he says. But he, verse 11, but he, read this with me. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Is he talking about the new heavens and new earth when we're all glorified and sinless? I don't think so. He's talking about y'all. That you are in the kingdom of heaven after Jesus Christ said it is finished at the cross and ascended to the throne of God and poured out the Holy Spirit on the church. That because we are, are, are around this side of the cross, we are greater than the greatest one born of woman before Jesus came. Is that amazing? That's, that's the newness and the glory of the new covenant. That's what the Holy Spirit coming to live not just with you, but in you and making you the temple of God will do to you. We, sinful and weak, you feel like you're the least in the kingdom sometimes? Paul said, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the least of the saints. You know, I'm the chief of sinners. You are greater than the greatest man, greatest person, man or woman, born of woman, up to John the Baptist. Because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father's work in your life through Jesus, His Son. Verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. Go back to Acts. That's who John the Baptist is. He is the greatest Old Covenant prophet. All the prophets prophesied until John. And so that gives us the backstory. Click on all the prophets. I mean, just a just a just an a, a, and flying in an F eighteen over. The, the scriptures from Genesis forward, what do we see? Adam and Eve made in God's image, rebelling against God, believing Satan and trying to be their own gods. And God preaching the gospel to Adam and Eve as he rebukes the devil. He says to the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He would have to do it by his spirit because the woman's on the devil's side now, right? So is Adam. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall crush your head. Singular, right? Not the, your, your seed's head. Jesus, singular. He would crush the devil himself's head. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Jesus crushed the devil's head by having his heel bruised at the cross, you see? So there's this promise, the beginning. What, what's being promised? The new covenant. Isn't it amazing? That God was going to have to show up and do everything that the lambs and the bulls and all that were going to point to, you see, and that the high priest pointed to. Right? God was going to have to do it himself in the flesh. His name would be Jesus. God saves. The Lord saves. The Lord is salvation. So this promise, the seed of the woman, right? This one man would crush the head of the devil. He would defeat him at the cross. So seed of the woman. And you got Noah. 
You know, the earth had become so sinful and, you know, God regretted that he had made man even though he's sovereign and ordained all those things. God ordained things he hates. God ordained things that he would experience suffering as God experiences suffering at the sinfulness of human beings on the earth. And so he was going to destroy the whole earth, every living thing on it, um, except for Noah and his family. So you got Noah and the ark. But God made this covenant with Noah and his seed that he would no longer destroy the earth by flood. And with the, when the bird came with the leaf in her mouth, showing, what did that show? There were trees now again, right? The theater of redemption would be preserved until redemption was accomplished at the cross. There would be trees. There would need to be trees. You know why? Because God was going to come to die on a tree. That rainbow is a battle bow aimed up at God saying, I'm not going to destroy the earth because I'm going to take the arrow at the cross. That's what the rainbow means. When you see a rainbow sticker, think of Jesus at the cross for you. God saying, I will take the arrow in your place. That's why I'm not going to destroy y'all anymore. Even though you're just as bad in your hearts as the people before that I destroyed in the flood. Then he comes to this, this pagan guy from Ur of the Chaldeans named Abram. And he invades his life and he calls him out and he makes a people. And he says, in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. That's new covenant promise. That's not just Jews. That's Gentiles too. So again, you see the new covenant. And he, that Jesus is going to come who would be a descendant of Abraham. And he would, he would bring blessing to the earth. Abraham also offered up his son Isaac on the mountain. God stopped him from killing him. But you have this gospel in your face stuff going on with Abraham. The seed of the woman, which is going to be the seed of Abraham, a, an old fatherless guy with a barren wife. And then Isaac, in your seed, the, in Isaac, those would be chosen, right? The miracle baby, not the get with your servants and just make it happen because God's not coming through for you, but you're even lots older and God had to bring life to a dead womb and make Isaac, a, the children of promise. The seed of Isaac, that, that salvation would come. And, and, I, and I'll, I'll speed up, but you got you know, Moses. I will raise up a prophet like you from among your brethren. Whoever hears him will be, will be blessed and saved, but whoever rejects him will be done away with. You were, they were right to offer to ask for a mediator. See? And then David, I, I, the son of David, the seed of David, I'm going to build you a house. And, and your seed will sit on the throne, on my throne forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Amen. And then the prophets, the suffering servant, the seed would not just be a king, but he would be a crucified Jew. He would be the suffering servant upon whose head all our sins would be laid. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own ways. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It pleased the Lord to crush him. Because our sins would be on him. And God is just and he hates evil and we're evil. And Jesus took our evil on himself to suffer it. To suffer God's wrath for it. To die and rise again. He will see his seed and, and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. There's resurrection promises there too, right? So the prophets, you're going in, going in. Malachi, where this promise of John the Baptist, God's saying, I'm going to show up myself. You know, Isaiah talks about, you know, the incarnation, all the Christmas stuff, right? A child is born, a virgin. God says, I'm going to, I'm going to, I am going to come. And then speaking to Jesus, uh, I'm going to send my messenger before your face. John the Baptist is in there. And that's where we are in the ministry of John the Baptist. He is the consummate old covenant prophet saying, Jesus is the Christ. I am not the Christ. There is one coming after me. What? Luke, Luke 3, 16, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
That's the, that's the new covenant. I baptize with water, but there's one coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. See, if you're going to graph the emphases of the Bible, think about what your graph would be. Like, you know, sin, Jesus, Israel, whatever. Like, just list some Bible-y words, okay? And then put the Holy Spirit on your graph. Where is your graph on the Holy Spirit? I'm guessing, now not that, not that the Spirit loves to emphasize Himself, He points the spotlight on Jesus, right? But the emphasis of how big a deal it is that we get the Holy Spirit in that new covenant way is, a, is really high on the Bible's graph. Where is it on your graph? Where is your awareness of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit? Where is your praying to God, asking Him to fill you and refill you with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis? Where is your faith looking to the Word of God saying, I don't feel filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, I feel horrible. Maybe that's, He's convicting you of sin. You don't know, right? But are you looking to the Word when Jesus says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? It's funny, He says, your Father in Heaven, He's talking to believers. You need the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you know you need the Holy Spirit? That's how we started in the book of Acts, way back. God was teaching your pastor that he actually kind of actually really needs the Holy Spirit. And he was teaching you that too. And he's reminding us this morning, we need the Holy Spirit. So John's baptism was one of repentance and promise. He's like, it's not done yet. Like, this isn't it. Like, I'm glad you all came out to the Jordan River to get baptized and repent and all that. But this isn't it. Like, I'm baptizing you with water, but there's one who's going to baptize you with God. So that God can live in you. Not just, not just be with you in a temple where you'd get fried if you went behind the veil. But God's going to live in you. In His fullness. As a down payment. For our inheritance of a new heavens and a new earth, of our glorification, of our sinlessness. That's awesome. Amen. That's the old covenant. Glory, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus, the one who is coming, whose sandal strap John wasn't worthy to lose, the one who, who was before John, even though John was older and born first, that eternal Son of God. Remember, he was before me. John was born first. So was, oh wait, he's eternal. <laughs> That's what he's saying. This one freaked John out. You know how he freaked him out? He said, I want you to baptize me. He's like, what the, what, what, what? You know, you don't get, what? That blew his mind. Why? Jesus was being registered in our place. If you do something really bad with people who are of a certain age, you get on a registry. And when you move to a place, you can look up people. Who's on that list? Who do I not want to live by? Who do I want to trust my kids around? Right? You know what I'm talking about? That baptism is the equivalent of that. Think, think about that. That's how shocking it was for John. A sinless man going, I want to get on that registry. So when people look it up on the computer about where they don't want to live, Jesus' name would be on there. You know what? Because he was repenting in our place. Baptism was a shameful thing. Baptism symbolized cleansing through judgment. Baptism is saying, I am dirty, 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 and I can't cleanse myself. Yeah. That's what baptism is saying. And Jesus came to look dirty in our place at the cross. Right? And so he came to be baptized as, as a performance art and as a fulfillment of, of the law of the Old Covenant. Jesus says, I have to fulfill all righteousness. And if this consummate Old Covenant prophet is saying, y'all need to get cleaned up because God's coming to town. If he's saying that, I'm going to come and do that in your place. You know, even our repentance needs washing with the, 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 the Puritan said, even our tears of repentance need washing with the blood of Christ. Here's the good news. Jesus wasn't literally saying I'm a sinner, but he in one sense, even repented in your place. When we're confessing our sins, you're like, God, I know I'm more sinful. Wait, is this sinful? Was, was I sinning when I did this? I'm not sure. Well, whatever is not a faith is sin. Or are you like me? If you're not, you're like, he's weird, but whatever is not a faith is sin. Was that sin or not? I don't know, Lord. And you feel like your repentance stinks. And you're like, am I really confessing my sins? I don't know. God knows your heart. And Jesus even repented perfectly in your place. Amen. Amen. It's beautiful. 
So here's the new covenant. It's the fulfillment of the old covenant promise. It's the permanent indwelling of God. See, we forget that the Holy Spirit is fully God. He's the almighty creator who is hovering over the waters at creation. He is almighty God. He's the one that, uh, that Peter said, you have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, he is God. You can grieve him. He's a person. He's not a force. He's not a power. He's not an energy. He's a person and he's fully Amen. God. And he has come to live inside of us sinners. That's how good a job Jesus did at the cross. Look, look at this. Look at the experience of these disciples in Ephesus. Look at Acts. And this isn't just caffeine. This is God answering our prayers to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And just because you're not loud doesn't mean you're not full of the Holy Spirit. But I want to give God the glory that that's what He's doing right now because He's faithful. He's a good dad. He's not like us. Amen. Right? Amen. Feel, feel me? Amen. Right. Acts 19. Verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Again, what makes sense out of this? Because you're thinking, well, I believe. Does that mean I do I like do I have the Holy Spirit? This is the overlap time of the old covenant and the new covenant. You see, and there's questions I can't answer. But this is my best understanding of what's going on in this passage here. Is that did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? Remember the apostles early on in Acts would lay hands on people who were already believers. And then they, then they would receive the Spirit. And the visible manifestation of that time was speaking in these foreign tongues as a judgment to Israel, the Bible prophesies in Isaiah. And that I will speak to you with, peop uh, with, uh, with people of foreign tongues. I will speak to you with foreign tongues. So there's this visible demonstration of the presence of the Holy Spirit given to Gentiles as a proof to the church that salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone. You don't have to be Jewish to be saved. You just have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ just like the Jews had to do in the first place, you see. And so there is this visible manifestation of the Spirit. He says, they say, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said to them, into what then were you baptized? See, isn't that an interesting question? Paul knows that there are people who who were kind of like, they were part of the way there, right? They, they, they had the word of the Lord accurately, but they needed to be instructed like Apollos in the way of the Lord more accurately. And so they said into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance. This is Acts 19.4 I'm reading from. Saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is, and here he gives the name on Christ or King or Anointed One, Messiah, Mashiach, Jesus. The one anointed and empowered with the Holy Spirit and given the authority to anoint and empower us with the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus at Pentecost was the one who poured out the Holy Spirit on the disciples. It was evidence of His Enthronement. It was part of the vindication of Jesus. It was like the resurrection from the dead. It was this, yes, it really is finished. The gospel really is true. And so what happened to these guys? When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, some people try to say that John's baptism was Christian baptism. And therefore, you know, you don't get rebaptized when you have a legitimate baptism first. So this must not have been a baptism with water. This must be just like they were. But I don't think that's what this is saying. I think when it's used, when he uses baptized, they were baptized with water. They weren't being rebaptized. They were receiving Christian baptism for the first time because it was connected with the name of Jesus. Amen. And see, so when God shows up in the flesh and has a name and a street address, you, you can't, what you do with him matters. The name of Jesus 